Hi everyone, when is Christ coming back? I've had questions like that and discussions like that with various ones, my brother and other people. Uh, could he come possibly tonight? You know, there are a lot of people who believe that, boy, you better get everything right because Christ could come tonight. And, uh, or is it more likely that there's still some years left? I am not one who thinks it's 30, 40, 50 more years or whatever. I am one who feels we are getting very, very close to the end. But no, Christ is not coming back tonight, and I want to talk about that today, why I say that. There are events that Scripture says have, have to happen first, events that have to happen to transpire before God will send Yeshua back as King of Kings. Can we be sure he's, that he's not coming back tonight? Can we? Yes, we can. I'll show you that. Who knows when Christ will return? 2,000 years ago, Yeshua said only one being in the universe knew the exact day and hour, and that was God his Father. In Acts 1, Acts 1, verses 6 and 7, after his resurrection, before the day of Pentecost, the apostles buttonholed Yeshua, <clears throat> and they said to him, in verse 6 and 7, asking him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. So it's very clear there. Also in Mark 13, 32, he says, Of that day, after listing all the many things which we'll get into shortly, Mark 13 is a parallel chapter to Matthew 24. Mark 13, But of that day and of that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor does the Son know, but only the Father. So as of 2,000 years ago, even Yeshua had no idea what day or hour would be the day of his coming back. I believe it's possible that he knows now, by now, when it would be, but we just aren't told that. But as we get closer and closer to the actual return, I'm going to read uh, verse, in fact, let's read it now. Mark 13, verse 28, 29, uh, where he says that just as you can tell summer is nigh, as you look at the budding trees and so on. Now, let's read it. Mark 13, 28, 29. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is here. Summer's near. So you also, when you see these things happening, Know that it's near, at the doors. When you see what things? The things he had just talked about in the previous 27 verses. Things that have to happen before he returns. So at some point, you and I will be able to say, according to this, wow, look at that, the great tribulation started, or the signs in the heavens have clearly have started, uh, pandemics galore, one after the other after the other. And we can read what it says in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. And we can say, now we know we're within five years, within four years, within three and a half years, and so on. And um, these signs are, are, are very clear as we read of them in, in the book of Daniel and Revelation. So greetings again, everybody. I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host, founder of Light on the Rock, where we glorify Yeshua. He was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and all things were made by the Word. God the Father made all things, created all things through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 9, Hebrews 1, uh, verses uh, 1 to 3, and many other places. So he was there from the beginning with God. He said in John 17, by the way, in verse 5, it's not in my notes, but he said, Glorify me now with the glory that I had with you before the world was with the glory I had with you. I'm saying all this because there are some people who are beginning to say again that Yeshua, that Jesus Christ, is a created, was a created being and did not exist before his human birth. Garbage, baloney, ridiculous, wrong. Okay, don't buy into that stuff. So back to my questions. When is Christ returning? I'm trying to keep my language <laughs> right. Can it be tonight? Can it even be in the next few months? Can it even be in the next two or three years? I say no. Not that he's going to delay his coming, but there are a sequence of events. and We're given certain dates and times or how long, that's what I'm really saying, that things could happen. 
Let's not be like Ellen G. White, who said it would come in 1844. Let's not be like uh, William Miller. Is that, yeah, William Miller, the Millerites, also in 1844. October 22, 1844, they all gathered up on hills and in trees and so on. I believe it was that, that was in Massachusetts. They'd seen a comet before that. Herbert Armstrong, uh, he believed that 1975 would be the time that Christ would return. The Jehovah's Witnesses thought it was 1914. I don't believe they teach that officially now as a doctrine today because Christ didn't come in 20, I mean in 1914. They tried to excuse that for a while by saying, well, he came to heavenly Mount Zion, not to earthly Mount Zion. No, he hasn't come back yet. We don't know the year yet. Even now we don't. I'm suspecting we're within nine or ten years. I am. But I don't know. I'm certainly not setting any dates. Add to that the hundreds of people who've said uh, he could come tonight. Uh, but he hasn't come tonight or any one of those other many thousands of nights where that had been said. The only ones who could see Christ coming tonight would be those who would die today or tonight and their next waking moment from their spiritual sleep would be the resurrection seeing Christ in the clouds, angels taking them up to Christ, as 1 Thessalonians 4 says, ahead of those of us who remain alive, uh, we get changed after they are changed to spirit first. Those are the only ones who could have a perception that in, their, in the way they feel, hey, I died, next moment I'm with him, that, that's, that could seem like tonight to them. Those are the only ones. Okay, Death, remember, in God's view, is just a sleep. And so when Lazarus was going to be resurrected, what did Yeshua say? He hung around for a while where he was. He let Lazarus die. In John 11, verse 11 to 14, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. John 11, 11. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. His disciples said, why would you wake him up? Sleep would be good for him. Maybe that would help him get well. Verse 12. Verse 13, however, Yeshua spoke of his death. Sleep, death, okay? But they thought he was speaking of him taking rest in sleep. So he made it very clear and he said, Lazarus has passed away. Nope, he doesn't say passed away. He doesn't say passed on. Those terms aren't used in the Bible. The terms used in the Bible for death are death, die, dying, dead, sleep, um, what else? Uh, there's, also, uh, there's also the saying of uh, he gave up his spirit because in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, we're told that our spirits, the spirit in man, that makes us different from animals, that gives us a mind that has the interface with God's Holy Spirit. I have a sermon on the spirit in man you can go to. The spirit in man goes back to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. That's not the man... That's not the person, but it's some kind of record or something by which God will recreate in the resurrection that same person. But all those are up in heaven. Our spirits do go to heaven. That's why Yeshua said on the cross, into your hand I command my spirits. My spirit. And uh, Stephen said something similar uh, about his spirit going to God. And whenever Yeshua would resurrect someone like like I believe the story of Jairus' daughter, and uh, it says her spirit returned to her. Her spirit returned to her body, brought back to life. So that may explain the near-death experiences too, that as the spirit goes back to God, there is some knowledge and, 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 and recollection or visual of what's going on. Uh, I, I, I don't deny those hundreds of stories. I'm just saying that uh, Jesus did say very clearly in John 3.13, no one, no man, no one has ascended to heaven. But anyway, but other than those who die right now, today, tonight, their next waking moment being with Christ, and it will be perceived by them like they, that Christ came tonight to them, but it really could be years and years and years. So how can I be sure he's not coming back? Because the Bible says he's not coming back until certain things happen. So let's start with that. For example, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 4. Paul was dealing with the same thing. 
Thessalonians and others, they all wanted Christ to return right away. Uh, will you at this time set up your kingdom? As they asked him just before the day of Pentecost. And so people were quitting work. They weren't working. They, weren't, they were just waiting. And then the word started getting out there that he's already come. So Paul writes this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 4. Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, and our gathering together with him, we ask you don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, so someone trying to say the day's already come or it's coming tonight, that is a deception, Paul says, because it won't happen, he says. It will not come unless the falling away comes first. Apostasy. Some believe that's happened already. But he goes on, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Then he describes this man so that we can identify him when, he, when we see him. Who opposes, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God. Now get that. In the temple of God, he sits as God, showing himself that he is God. That hasn't happened yet. So as Paul says, don't be deceived, the day won't come until that man of sin who says, I am God, and he's sitting in a temple of God, saying he is God, wanting everybody to worship him. It's not going to happen yet. In the complete Jewish Bible, I'll read it there too, in, the connection with, in connection with the coming of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily shaken in your thinking or anxious because of a spirit or a spoken message or a letter, supposedly from us, claiming the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Verse 4, the end of verse 3, For the day will not come until after the apostasy has come and the man who separates himself from Torah lawlessness has been revealed, the one destined for doom. He will oppose himself to everything that people call a god or make an object of worship. He will put himself above them all so that he will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he himself is God. The absolute horrific vanity and sin to be able to be someone who can do that. Paul says a mouthful here. He says, don't think Christ is coming right away until this happens. We have to see a man of sin show up first. And this great, he's probably the great false prophet that Revelation 13 talks about, who will demand to be worshipped in some future temple of God. Some think this temple of God has to be the church because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and other places that we are the temple of God. But how can a man sit in me and in you and in the people around the world who are the ones who make up the spiritual temple of God? No, it's talking about a real physical building here. But some people have argued with me to say, but Philip, nothing that man makes today could be called the temple of God. I said, really? I said, what about Herod's temple? Wasn't that the temple of God? Oh no, that was Herod's temple. That was an evil man, evil people at the time. But you'll notice in John, uh, where is it? John uh, 2 verse 16, that Yeshua, when casting out those who were selling merchandise and money changers and all that, and he cast them out. And he says in John 2, 13, 16, Don't turn my father's house into a house of merchandise. My father's house. Yeshua called Herod's temple my father's house. So this notion that a future temple to be built, and I believe they can build it and get it done very quickly. I know I have seen with my own eyes the menorah that's going to be in that future temple. I'll try to send pictures of these things to send to you. I've seen with my own eyes the, the crown that the 
that the uh, high priest wears. Holiness to Jehovah, it says on it. I've seen the altar of incense, the table of showbread. I've seen the shofars that are being created. I've seen them making the, the garments for the, for the prophets, I mean the uh, priests. I've seen the high priest's garment. It's all visible. You go to the wailing wall, the, the western wall, right behind it, or if you go away from it, there's a hill. You go up there and there's a, there's a shop up there where they're doing all this. The temple, temple mount people. They deny that the veil has been made yet, or don't know. They say, I believe it's been made. They deny that any big uh, stones have been cut out. I believe there are. We've seen some. I'll try to send pictures. But anyway, so, yeah, the temple, I believe, has yet to be built. Uh, Daniel 9 seems to indicate that there will be sacrifices and in the middle of the week. I know that was partially fulfilled or, or fulfilled by Christ. I know that. But maybe in another end time, a covenant is made for seven years. Halfway through the seven years, this man of, who is not of God, but he says he is God, will stop the sacrifices. Go back and read that in Daniel 9, 27. Christ is not returning, though, according to Paul, until this man of sins revealed sitting in the temple. Has anything like that happened yet? Do we even see a temple yet? No, we don't. Do we see a man of sin yet? No, 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 we don't see any of this. At some point we'll see it. There are things happening. There are world events speeding up. Oh, you bet. I suspect strongly that this man of sin already is alive somewhere on the earth. Some like to dogmatically say this man of sin is this cardinal or this minister or this world leader or the pope. Or We need to ride loose in the saddle, folks, until we get a little closer and it will be very, very clear to us who he is. And remember when Messiah, you know, I had a blog titled, you might want to see it. Maybe we can show it on the screen, the, the, the blog. Uh, who are the beast and the false prophet? It's a blog. Just type in beast and false prophet in the search bar. And that will pop up. And I said in my blog, who we really want to find out is who is Christ? Who is God? Come to know them, like Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's where we should be putting our attention. God will reveal to us when he wants us to know who the man of sin is, who the beast and the false prophet are, what the mark of the beast is, what 666 refers to, who the two witnesses are. We will know that soon enough. Okay? And when it finally does happen, when Christ does come, Yeshua said it's going to be sudden, like in the days of Lot. Lot had probably minutes or an hour, maybe. And other verses said, God being merciful, uh, they pulled him out of the city. He had a very short time, minutes or hours. That was it. Uh, Noah had one week. One week, Noah, get the food in there, get the animals in there. God brought the animals, I believe, to Noah. I believe uh, they walked in there under God's direction. But uh, a week's not a long time when you got to get the whole ark ready to with food, water, and supplies and the animals and move yourself and your family in. So it's going to be sudden. When it comes, it's going to come quickly. On your own also, as we come to this end time, we are coming to it. Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51. Yeshua warns us, be busy doing the work, working the good work of God, doing the will of God. Don't stop working. Now, I've retired from my job. I'm, I'm getting close to 70. I've retired from my job so that I could focus on working light on the rock, emailing and talking to people, encouraging people, doing the work of ministry. I want to be able to focus on this. I'm not retired from just doing nothing, playing golf all day. I, I'm not. But God says in Matthew 24, 45, 50, 51, blessed is that servant. He finds so doing, so working, okay? It's not a time to slow down. So when I say Christ is not coming tonight, don't infer from that that I'm saying that he's not coming soon. It's not coming tonight. It's not coming next month. He's not coming in a year or two. Now, some years ahead of us, this is July, 20, uh, August now, 2021. Some years from now, it could be within a few years, but the date I'm giving this, he's not coming for several years yet. 
Here are some basic points. I already said, number one, that the man of sin who sits in the temple of God as God hasn't happened yet. Number two, I want to say this. God is incredibly patient. We might think it can't get any worse. We know about the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.1 that says, In the last days, perilous times shall come. And we say it can't get any more dangerous than today. It can't get any more evil than today. I beg to differ. I really beg to differ. Here's a couple of things you got to remember. When Paul says in the last days, he was saying, hey, what he was really saying was, guys, we're in the last days and we know perilous times are going to come. Look around you. And then soon after he wrote that, a few years after he wrote that, the temple itself is burned. Paul is killed. Paul is, himself is beheaded. Christians were being crucified. In 70 AD, they couldn't find any more trees or wood to crucify them. There were so, I think 100,000 Jews were crucified at the burning of the temple in 70 AD. Many were sent into slavery. Many were raped. Many were killed. Just an awful time. There were famines. There was Mount Vesuvius that exploded over there at Pompeii. And so, yeah, this must be it. Earthquakes, famines, there were famines, there were plagues, there were pandemics going on. You know, even Paul speaks of a famine in Jerusalem. So he's saying this, yeah, we're, I think we're in the last days. But as bad as you think it is, I think it could get a whole lot worse. Paul thought he was referring to his time. Paul thought he was in the last days because he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, talking about those who die in the Lord, who sleep in the Lord, he says. Okay, we who are alive and remain in the Lord shall not proceed, won't be resurrected ahead of, shall not proceed those who are asleep. Again, sleep tied into death. They have died. So we who are alive, we who are alive and remain. Paul thought he was in the last days. Apostle John said, we're in the last hour, 1 John 2.18. The brother of Jesus, Apostle James, not the other James, but the Apostle James, who became a leader of the Jerusalem church, he says, the coming of the Lord is at hand, James 5, verse 8. I'll try to post as many of these on the board as, we, as I speak. So in the Apostles' day, they couldn't imagine the world getting any worse. The Christians were being slaughtered in the Colosseum, being used as playthings for tigers and lions to be ripped up and eaten. God did allow them to be killed. They were being crucified. They were being rubbed with tar all over their crucified body in, um, in um, Nero's garden parties and then lit alive. Somehow the screams of people dying as they burned on a crucifixion was entertainment for that incredible, horrible Nero. So God's incredibly patient. All that's happened. The Inquisition's happened. World War I and II has happened. He's not here yet. In Genesis 6, he tells, uh, he tells us that God gave mankind 120 more years. He says they're so bad that if they don't change, I'm going to have to wipe them all out with a flood. I'll give them 120 more years. Genesis 6, 3. He told Abraham, I'm going to give all this land to your descendants, when Abraham didn't even have Isaac yet at this point, I don't think. So, certainly he, he didn't have as the stars of heaven in multitude. And so he says, uh, but I, not yet, not yet, because they're going to go away into another land, and they're going to come back, and then I'll give them this land. Then in Genesis 15, verse 16, the reason God gives, I'm saying he's very patient, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, is not yet complete. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And so God is very, very patient. I hope you're, you're getting that point. Um, so we might not even have 10 or 20 more years left, but if that's all we have, and he, he comes within 9 or 10 or 20 years, hallelujah, that, that'd be wonderful. Let's get it over. Let's get all the horrible things that have to happen over with. And uh, we should want that. Not a delaying. We shouldn't want the postponing. It's kind of like if you know your foot has to be cut off or you've got to have a root canal, something you don't look forward to. You finally just say, let's get it over with. 
because I know that after the root canal, I'll be better off. I'll be fine. So God is patient. We might have 20, 30, 40 more years. We might not. I'm thinking less than 10. God hasn't told me, so I don't know, and I'm not telling you. I'm just saying God is patient, so don't be amazed if it does go longer. The more important thing is that you be ready. Don't get ready. Be ready. There are verses that say, be ready. And you'd be working for God as we wait. Be sure your lamps are full of oil. Make sure your wicks on your lamps are, spiritually speaking, are trimmed and ready. Make sure you're burning the Holy Spirit in your life. Make sure you're spending time praying, seeking God's word, finding Yeshua, finding the Father. Those who seek me will surely find me, Father says. Focus on that. That's why I've stopped working for an income and, and, and working now for this. God will provide. And so that's what I'm trying to do now. Frankly, if Christ took another 50 or 100 years, if he did, if God the Father did, what am I saying? If we're so submitted to the will of God and we pray, your will be done. Yes, we pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like it is up there in heaven. So if God's will is that it, that it be a lot longer yet, we don't fight it. We're good. We're good with that. Okay? But neither do we want to fall into the other ditch of saying God delays his, his coming. Woe to anyone who preaches that. I'm not preaching that. I'm saying God is patient, so it may be longer than we want. But don't go the other ditch and say that God delays his coming. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Everything... Since the fathers fell asleep, there's the sleep again. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So scripture does give us both possibilities, though, that time will be shortened and that there might be a perceived delay. Scripture gives us both possibilities. Some scriptures indicate his coming will catch many off guard. It's so sudden. And Mark 13, verses 19 to 20 says, those days will be trouble, tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever again shall be. It's going to be the worst time ever. Worse than the Spanish Inquisition. Worse than the days of the Vikings. Worse than anything you can imagine. Verse 20, and un so let's get it over with, right? So unless the Lord shortens those days, or had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, because of you. Let that sink in. Because of you, and me, and the brethren, the elect of God, the bride of Christ, those being led by his spirit. But for the elect's sake, the end of verse 20, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now, in context, though, it does appear that this shortening happens after the tribulation has started. So it might not be quite as long as we think it's going to be. Then, boom, that, and that's why it might also give the perception of suddenness. We're all thinking we've got another six months or five months, or according to our timetables and chronologies, and we lose track of the time of being ready. So it does appear that there is a shortening of time. There's also, there are also a lot of scriptures, several anyway, that clearly state that there's a perception it could go longer than we might think. So, for example, Matthew 25, in the parable of the ten virgins. These were ten virgins who got ready, got their oil and everything. They're, they're all dressed up, ready to go. They went out to meet the bridegroom, thinking he was coming at a certain time. Didn't come. Didn't come the next day. Didn't come the next night. Didn't come the next day. Where is he? So let's read what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like the ten virgins who take their lamps, took their lamps, and went out to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Christ. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil, or no extra oil with them, because they were able to have a light. You'll see the light was going out. They had some oil. But the foolish took their lamps, took no extra oil with them, and the wise took oil with their vessels, with the lamps. But while, who's speaking here? It's Yeshua. He himself is speaking here. 
while the bridegroom was, what? Delayed. Verse 5. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight. Who gets married at midnight? Some say it wasn't that uncommon back then. But at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom's coming. Go out and meet him. All the virgins arose. They, by the way, the end of verse 5. They all, all, all God's people slumbered, slept. Does that sound like a zealous group? Or does it sound like the latest sins? At midnight, a cry was heard. He's here, guys. Get ready. All the virgins arose. They trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oils. Our lamp's going out. The wise said, No, lest there should not be enough for us. Go buy from those who sell and buy for yourselves. While they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterwards, the other virgins came and also said, Lord, Lord, open to us. He answered and said, Assuredly, I said to you, I don't know you. I don't know you. Verse 13, watch therefore. It's a mean watch world news and all that because frankly, much of what's going on, we, we aren't being told. Most of the time when scripture says to watch, it's to watch our spiritual condition. Watch ourselves and our relationship to God. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. One more verse we'll look at, just to show you that Bible, the Bible does speak of a possible perceived delay. Revelation 10, verses 5 to 7. I know scoffers will say the Lord delays his coming, so I'm not saying that. I'm just pointing out God is patient. There may be a shortening of time at the very, very end, so there's a suddenness impression, but there's also an impression before that happens that there's a delay. Revelation 10, verses 5 to 7. The angel, when I saw standing, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things in it, and sea and the things that are in it. The end of verse 6. That there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets that there should be no delay any longer. But once the seventh angel sounds, that's the last trump. Christ returns. The mystery of Christ, God's glory. God's glory in us, Christ in us. I need to, I have sermons on the mystery, and I'll, I'll probably redo those soon as a video. Update them a bit. I gave them way, way long time ago, 2004 or something. The mystery of the bride, the mystery of the groom, the mystery of the wedding. So again, the important thing is be ready, okay? So, so far we've seen the Father decides when, he, when Christ comes. Paul said certain things like the man of sin uh, in the temple of God, declaring he is God has to happen. And the day won't come until that happens. I've mentioned God is patient. So God may take longer than we want. And whenever God decides to send Christ, we must be ready. A lot of people have made uh, the 6,000 year time between early creation, 4004 BC. So that would take us to 2004. So where is he? But if you take it from the time of Christ's resurrection in 30 AD, that may be the point where the next couple thousand years would come. It's glorified in the third day. There's something, it's a verse that talks about the third day in the Old Testament. It's not in my notes here. But that would point the end of the second, the beginning of the third, would point us, I think, to 2030. But again, I, I'm not setting a date. I'm just thinking, I think 2030 could be a very interesting time, okay? Which means things will, in the next nine years, things will get really bad, really, really bad in a, in a real big hurry if 2030 is what we're looking at. But again, I don't want to set dates. It could be 2031, it could be 2040, it could be whatever God wants. Did you hear me? I'm not setting dates. But watch 2030, it might be interesting. 
So whenever God decides to send Christ, we must be ready. So what are the things that Christ said, that Messiah himself said, would have to happen before God would send him back? Matthew 24, I'm going to go through there. I want you, if you have your own Bibles, to go to Matthew 24 and then also to Revelation 6. And we're going to tie those two together because the seals of Revelation 6 tie in very closely to Matthew 24. Yeshua warned, false prophets are coming. Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. That matches the white horse, the first seal of Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2. Next, there are wars and rumors of wars. Constant talk of wars. That's Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, but the end is not yet. That's the second seal, the red horse. Revelation 6, verse 3 and 4. He speaks of famines, worldwide famines. <clears throat> Matthew 24, the end of verse 7. That's the third seal of Revelation 6, verse 5 and 6, the famine. And this little bit of food sold for this much money and so on. You can read those. And then the fourth seal is uh, Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8. Pestilences. We call them pandemics. Ever hear of a pandemic? There are going to be many more. Many more. This is not going to stop now. Once the scroll, the seals of Revelation are opened, it stays open while they, while they continue to unfold, unroll the rest of the seal. And as it stays open, it gets more and more intense. Fourth seal, pandemics. Widespread death all over the earth. That's the pale horse of Revelation 6. Verse 7 and 8, and earthquakes are included in there. Of course, we're also told in Matthew 24, the gospel has to be preached to everyone all around the world. So no one has an excuse. Everyone means it has to be preached to the Hindus, to the Muslims, to the Buddhists, to the atheists, to the pagans, to the witch, witches, people involved in all that, to everyone to Russia, to China, to Iran, Saudi Arabia, to Laos, Myanmar, all of these nations, Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, America, all around the world, we have to hear this gospel of the kingdom and of its king, let me say too. Because Paul said, the, I'll tell you what gospel I preached to you. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talked all about Christ, him crucified and raised again. So the gospel of the kingdom has to include the king. Everyone has to hear it. Right now, according to the voice of the martyrs, a periodical I get from them, many, many people around the world are trying to get Bibles into all the world. Many of them are captured, tortured, killed, put in jail. We have ministers who preach Christianity who are in jail. It's going to get worse, but it will get preached. Thank God we have men and women in villages who are willing to be kicked out of their village, unemployed, jailed, beaten, tortured, because they believe in Christ. And then after that, we might see the beginning traces setting the stage for this already. The great tribulation, the time of trouble comes, such as the world has never seen. And that's the fifth seal. That's the fifth seal. Matthew 25, uh, 24, verses 15 to 22. That's the fifth seal, Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22. Someone called uh, the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place. That almost sounds like what we heard in 2 Thessalonians 2. Then when you see that happen, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. It's Matthew 24, verses 16 to 21. I do believe that there is a place of protection that God will put his church, those who zealously know him and he knows them, that no matter what he puts on them, they will not deny him. <clears throat> About the same time, I believe the two witnesses. We don't know who they are yet. A lot of people say it's going to be Moses and Elijah brought back to earth because the miracles they do 
typified by Moses and Elijah. But listen, John the Baptist was a type of Elijah, but he wasn't Elijah. But when they were asking Jesus about John the Baptist, why do they say Elijah must first come? He says Elijah, by this time, Eli by this time John the Baptist had died already, had been beheaded, because he spoke up. Let me make a note here in my notes, because none of this is in my notes. Uh, he said, Elijah shall come and has come. And they all understood that he spoke of John the Baptist, the baptizer. So anyway, there are going to be two witnesses mentioned in Revelation 11. So please read that if you're not familiar with it. We're warned not to believe anyone saying that he's come already or he's in the that Christ has come already. Don't be fooled by that. After the Great Tribulation, next will be, according to Matthew 24, 29, and um, uh, there will be a signs in the heavens. The heavens shall be shaken. Okay, And when we see these scary heavenly signs, the moon not giving its light, the sun not giving its light, the moon looking like a blood-covered moon, what looks like stars falling from heavens, the meteorite showers, meteor showers, near misses by asteroids, and the powers of the heavens shaken. It's going to be a scary time. If we start getting uh, even a small asteroid hitting land or city, if it's a big asteroid that hits the Earth, that could be lights out for all of us. So that's why I said near misses, but scary indeed. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, Matthew 24, 29, the sun will be dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. That means that we can look up and see it. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And by, by heaven, he means the heavens where the birds fly, where the clouds are. Coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, if we jump to, we're done now with Revelation 6. Let's jump in now with Revelation 7. Six seals have gone. Uh, the scroll's being opened, and, and each time you come to a sealed area, they had to break it open. Okay, here's the sixth one. Now we're at the seventh one. At this point, God says there's a bunch of people, 144,000, at this point, who have not taken the mark of the beast, who are alive, who need to be protected. So he tells the angels, don't do anything else until we seal these 144,000. Until we seal them. God spares them from what's going to come beyond that. Beyond the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, there's a great innumerable multitude that are also mentioned in Revelation 7, who will be in the first resurrection. So, those of you who think the first resurrection is only 144,000, what do you do with, with a great innumerable multitude? What do you do with all the people who were alive and served God, the apostles and everybody else? Remember, it says in Revelation 7, these 144,000 are alive at that point. I know that's different than what most people preach, but read it for yourself. Why do they have to be sealed? If you're dead, you don't have to be sealed. You're already protected. You're dead. Just awaiting the resurrection. And we're already all sealed by the Holy Spirit. These people in Revelation 7 have to be given the Holy Spirit. Protected. Also in Revelation, many other things are listed as having to happen first. The two witnesses, Revelation 11, mentioned that already. It says they will be preaching for 1,260 days. In the Bible, a year was 360 days, biblical days. That's a three and a half year period. And this is before Christ's return. Just before the seventh trumpet is sounded, they are killed and then resurrected, and then the seventh trumpet sounds. You'll read that in Revelation 11. We don't know who these people are yet. They're alive somewhere, I believe, on earth. I don't believe they're Moses and Elijah, literally. I, I just don't. They'll be in the power, in the form of, <clears throat> represented by Moses and Elijah, but they won't be Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are among those that Hebrews 11 says, these all died. 
not having received the promises yet, but waiting all for us to be perfected with us. Revelation 12, the other thing happening, the church, the woman, is taken to her place in the wilderness, a place prepared by God. That is not heaven. Heaven is not a wilderness. And they're there also for 1260 days. They're there also for three and a half years. Is that the same three and a half years as the two witnesses? Most of us think so. Ride loose in the saddle, we'll see. But there are some who aren't taken to her place because they're not counted worthy to escape these things. Luke 21, 36, I gave a sermon on it. Luke 21, 36, pray that you be counted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass. So some aren't taken to a place of safety. Our real safety is God, is in God, whatever God wants in our life. That's our real safety. But it does seem there's a place God puts is zealous people. And then Revelation 12, it says there's some, the remnant of this woman, who don't go there, and Satan comes after them with a flood. Probably means an army. Flood in the Bible often means armies. And they're described as the people of God who keep the commandments of God. All ten. Not just eight or nine. All ten. Including the fourth one. The Sabbath day. On the seventh day you shall rest. Do no work therein. For in seven days God created the heavens and the earth and ended all his work. He rested on the Sabbath day and hallowed it, sanctified it. I keep the seventh day Sabbath. You should as well. You should. Because those are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some of the other Sabbaths are the holy days of God. Goodness sakes, folk, the whole church of God started on a holy day, on Pentecost. They were there gathered together, worshiping God on a holy day. So I keep Pentecost. I keep all the holy days. Paul talked about Passover, days of unleavened bread. Zechariah 14 speaks of the Feast of Tabernacles and how all the Gentile nations also. Zechariah 14, verse 16 to 18. Go back and read it. They also will have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles or they'll have no rain until they do. God gives them free choice. God also has the choice to bless or not. Revelation 13, the beast and the false prophet are clearly on the scene at the same time. This all happens before Christ returns. Read and reread Revelation 13. I would say read and reread, especially Revelation 11, 13, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way to 19 and 20. Just read those several times. But are you getting the picture? There's a lot that's got to go on. There's also seven trumpets. There are also seven trumpets. At, and each trumpet has a, an, something happening. At the seventh trump is when the dead in Christ are resurrected, when Christ returns with the sound of a mighty blast or shofar. Will we hear the seven trumpets? I suspect God's people at least will. I say that because when the shofar of God, the ram's horn of God, sounded in Exodus 19, when he got ready to give the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, the Israelites heard this ear-splitting shofar. I believe God's people, at least God's people, will hear the seven trumpets. There's one. There's two. Five more. There's three. Four more. There's four. There's number five. And we're going to be getting more and more excited, praising God. Hallelujah. It's getting close. Finally getting close. May be the rest of the world may not hear it. I don't know. The Son of Man will come at the last trump, coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Matthew 24, verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. How will that be? He's going to flash like lightning, it says in Matthew 24. He's going to flash like lightning all around the world, back and forth and over and under many, many times. And this great scene that the world's never seen, the heavens opened up like a scroll. What in heaven is happening? Messiah is coming, and they will have been told by those who are preaching the gospel that this is something you can expect to see. And that's why so many 
become part of the great innumerable multitude in Revelation 7 who are not going to give in to the mark of the beast. The whole world will see him coming. It's not some secret rapture. And he will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, the shofar, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one heaven, one part of heaven to the other. Now we, the church, are resurrected along with those who died ahead of us. We're now taken to Christ in the clouds. Now what? At the end of the seventh trumpet, there are now seven last plagues. Mentioned in the book of Revelation. Some of those plagues have to take some months. The drying up of the Euphrates, for example. I think that's is that plague number six. I'm trying, to I'm trying to remember. The drying up of the Euphrates, Revelation 16. So the, so the way is cleared for the armies from the east, from India, China, and so forth, so forth, to come across. Though India and China and that part of the world might be fighting each other now, this will be kind of like Independence Day in the movie where this invasion from outer space is being seen and witnessed by the whole world. And so now the world that had been fighting each other come together to fight him and to fight us. But do we just hover over Jerusalem? So what happens next? The resurrected, bl 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 <laughs> the resurrected bride, the elect of God, are, I might be a bride, you, you can be the bride, okay? are presented to the king, the father, who has put on a wedding for his son in heaven. Matthew 22, a great king put on a wedding for his son. Okay, a wedding for his son. The king is God the father. Where's God the father? He's up in heaven. Who is the son? That's our Yeshua. Praise his holy name. Who's the bride? Ephesians 5 says that's us, the church. The Gentiles and the Jews now coming together as one. The spiritual Israel of God. He's, he's marrying Israel, the Israel of God. This time it's the spiritual Israel of God. Those who are circumcised in heart. Romans 2 talks about that in other places. Galatians 4 and 5 talk about it. The bride is seen on the Sea of Glass. I believe that's Revelation 15. The sea of glass is um, seen with fire under it. And they sing the song of Moses. Beautiful harmony. No one else can learn that song. Revelation 14, 144,000 are seen there in heaven. In heaven. While, meanwhile, the, while the wedding, then the wedding, they're invited into the wedding supper, Revelation 19. In heaven, it says clearly, I heard a voice in heaven. And this happened in heaven. Where else could you have a wedding that would make sense for the Lamb of God, the Son of God? Where else would be anything proper except on the sea of glass or wherever somewhere up there in heaven God decrees? Probably the sea of glass. I'm getting excited. While that's going on, there are seven deadly last bold plagues that are being poured out on earth. That seventh trump has seven last plagues, called bowl plagues. The elect bride is now up in heaven, being introduced to everybody else, being introduced to each other, getting ready for the wedding supper, and waiting out, the pouring out, the seven bowl plagues, which you can read about in Revelation 16. So I say, go back and read these things. I'm giving you an overview, so you can go back and make sense of the book of Revelation. Revelation 16, verses 12 to 15, it is the sixth plague, the drying up of the Euphrates. That's going to take several months to get millions of army people in place in Megiddo and all the way down to Jerusalem. Revelation 17 and 18, right about the same time, there's a quick and sudden demise, destruction, burning and killing of the end time Babylon the Great. The original Babylon was destroyed in one night. One night, by Darius the Mede and Cyrus and his armies, okay? They came and destroyed it. it. They made it fall. So the Bible talks about Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It falls twice. Ancient Babylon, modern-day Babylon. The ancient Babylon was a kingdom and a city. 
Modern day Babylon, it says, also is a city, but it has reign over all the kings of the earth. I'll speak more about the Babylon, the great whore who rides the beast power, the beast system, the political military system, until finally the ten horns that make up this beast system turn on the woman, hate the woman. Those thoughts put in there by God himself, it says in Revelation 17 and 18. So they turn on the woman, kill it, burn it, destroy it, burn her with fire. This great city that enriched the whole world. We'll talk about that more later. Now the wedding of the Lamb is about done. It's wrapping up now. Finally, we see Messiah, who's called the Word of God. Revelation 17, I think around verse 13, where it says that on his thigh or on his robe, it's written the word of God. I mean, the king of kings, the word. Of God. Anyway, whatever it says there, I, I don't have it written down here. But it identifies this Jesus coming back as the word of God. The same one who's called John 1, verse 1 and 2 and 3, that the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, everything created was created by the Word, nothing created wasn't created except by Him. Right? John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled with us. His name was Yeshua. The same Yeshua who in John 17, verse 5, said to God Almighty, He said, Father, glorify me now with the glory I had with you before the world was. He wasn't just finally existing at his birth. No, he was pre-existent God who thought it not robbery, Philippians 2, to be equal with God. But came as lowly flesh and died on the cross for us. That's our God. That's our Yeshua. That's our King. He's coming. He's the Word of God, it says in Revelation 19, verse, I believe, 13. And he gets on a mighty steed, angelic steed, as does his saints, as do his saints, and then all the angels behind all of us. So he comes with his mighty holy angels. He comes with us back to earth. What's greeting us when we come back to earth? A mighty army of humanity assembled in the valley of Megiddo. I've seen that valley. Many, many battles have been fought there up in northern Israel, north of the Sea of Galilee, northwest of the Sea of Galilee, and all the way down to Jerusalem, about almost 200 miles. And Scripture is very clear that all things consist and are held together by Christ. So if he decides not to hold something together, it dissolves. In Zechariah 14, where am I now? <laughs> Look at my notes here. Zechariah 14, verses 12 onwards, 12, and 12 to 15, it describes this grotesque, horrible way that those millions of people are going to die who are fighting Christ. Their eye sockets, their eyes will dissolve in their sockets. Their flesh will dissolve. Maybe I'll post this up here. And blood will run as deep, it says in Revelation 14, up to a horse's bridle for 200 miles, from Jerusalem all the way up to Megiddo. Don't be on the wrong side, folks. Don't take that mark of the beast. Don't give in to the beast power or the whore that rides the beast. Don't give in to the false prophet. If you have to die for Christ, he died for us. So be it. Hallelujah. Give us the power, strength, and the faith to trust you, dear God. Are you getting the picture? Christ isn't coming tonight. Too much to happen yet. He is coming soon, though. Possibly within nine years. Maybe 10 or 12 or 20. But I don't believe before eight or nine years. Personally, I don't. But if he shortens the time and we're down to five or six or seven years, then things are really going to speed up quickly, horribly, horribly. Take the time now, as I have. Maybe you can't resign from work. But look where you spend your time. Redeem the time, Paul says. 
spend the time in much, much more prayer. I even put sticky notes around various places. Pray again, pray again. <laughs> I talk to God as I walk around the house and do weeding and so on, but I, I mean to pray on my knees, asking for more of wisdom, more of the Holy Spirit, asking for blessings for all of you, asking for protection, insight, knowledge, wisdom, asking for more of the Holy Spirit for you and me. We must be spending much, much more time in the Word of God, in prayer. That's why I retired from my money focus and job, so I can focus on my spiritual health and my physical health. I am not in shape like I should be. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God's Spirit. I need to clean it out. I need to clean it up. I need to get it in shape, physically, but more importantly, even the spiritual. I want to stop wasting my time. i got to focus on the things that are strongholds of Satan that are in each of our lives. For some of you, your stronghold is wasting time. For some, the stronghold is lust. For some, the stronghold is money. For some, the stronghold is your relationships with people. For some, it's all of the above and more. We need to just face those, surrender them to Christ, ask Him to come and clean us up, Make us whole in Him. H-W-H-O-L-E, whole. So my point anyway is that a lot has yet to happen. Christ is not returning tonight, but He is returning soon. We must not be caught unprepared. We must be praying that we be counted worthy to escape these things. Luke 21, 36. Father in heaven, we just come before you and we ask you now to dismiss us, but come, Yeshua. Father, send our Messiah. Send our King. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. Help us be ready. Help us be busy, not slackers. Help us be busy doing your will, busy doing your work, busy praying and studying and fellowshipping with one another. Help us be prepared for what you have prepared for us. Help us not be caught off guard. Yeshua, live in me, live in all those hearing this. Watch over us. Protect us from the COVID pandemic and the many more that are coming. Protect us from persecution. Protect us from the evil one. Protect us from trials and temptations. And if we have to go through them, help us to thank you in them for them, knowing you're building something perfect and complete in us. We praise you. We glorify you. We love you. Help us love you more as we come to see how much you've forgiven each of us because one sin, Yeshua had to die for one sin as he would have had to die for a million sins. We all, we all fallen short of your glory. Now glorify us through your spirit to be glorifying you. Back to you. You are our light. You are our rock. Thank you. Let us be ready, dear God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.